Um, the first one, we're going we're gonna to look at Jesus' death. We're going to start with his death, and the second message later on, after we sing some more, we'll look at Jesus' life. But for now, why don't you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Okay, Luke chapter 23, and we're going to take a, a glimpse at the death of Christ here, familiar passage, and here's what I hope will happen. This is what I've been praying would happen for all of us, is that we would be reminded in a vivid way, in a fresh way of what Jesus did for us. What I've found recently with my own life is that uh, there's a temptation to get excited about the gospel, get excited about God's grace as theological concepts, as these notions or these thoughts of what God did, and they sort of just float out here and maybe in my mind out in space somewhere, and I don't really truly appreciate the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. The fact that over 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into the world to live for us and die for us. And not only that, but God raised him from the dead. And the same Christ who lived out those uh, in those events 2,000 years ago is the same Christ who lives today, who's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. So we're going to look at Luke 23 where Jesus is betrayed, and we're going to consider his death in a, in a fresh way. If you're there in your Bible, read verses 1 through 5 with me. It says, Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. Notice the false accusations of the people. They're saying that he is claiming that the citizens of Rome shouldn't pay their taxes. Of course, they knew that would be a good way to get him into trouble. Of course, um, They're also adding that he claimed to be a king, which he was, trying to get him in trouble. But Pilate, as he looks at this man, Pilate knows right away that he is innocent. And Pilate says, at the end of verse 4, I find no guilt in him. But they kept insisting and pressing and pressing. And so you know the rest of the story where Pilate hands Jesus over to Herod. Herod tries him. Herod finds him innocent as well. And then we look Later, and I'm going to read another section here, verses 13 and following, where once again, Pilate is talking about the innocence of Jesus. So as I read this, notice how many times Pilate says this man is innocent and not deserving of death. Notice, verse 13, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you have made against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, he says it again here in a different way, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now, he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, away with this man, release for us Barabbas. He was the one who had been thrown into prison for insurrection made in the city and for murder. In verse 20, Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them, saying, Oh, I'm sorry, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But verse 21, they kept on calling out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Again, Pilate declares that this man is innocent. Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So over and over and over again, Pilate says this man is innocent. And gives them an opportunity to release Jesus. You see, they had this custom that during the Passover, they would release one guilty criminal. A man on death row, they would let him go. Pilate knew of this custom, and he offered them the opportunity to let Jesus go. But instead, they chose Barabbas, a man who was clearly guilty, guilty of insurrection, insubordination, rebellion against the authority of the Romans, and guilty of murder, someone who had killed people. 
You know what's amazing about this first part of the story here where Jesus is going to his crucifixion is that God is telling us his favorite story. God really only has one story. It's the story that he sent his son to be our, here's a key word, substitute, to be our substitute, to die in our place. In this situation, does Jesus deserve to die? No. Another question. Does Barabbas deserve to die for his crimes? Yes. It's amazing that in this story of the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, God weaves throughout this, this idea of substitution. Right here before us is substitution. Here is Jesus the innocent one taking the place of one who is guilty and deserves to die. So as we think about the Easter season, we're kind of backing up here to Good Friday, okay? But as we think about Easter and the resurrection, that doesn't really have its full impact unless we first consider the death of Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ. And here's how that hits you in your life. Here's how that touches down in your life. All of you need a substitute. There are a lot of things that you can do in life. You can work hard, go to school, get a job, you, know, you can excel in sports, excel in music, excel in academics, all sorts of areas, things that we can do because of the gifts that God has given us. But here's what you cannot do. You can't live spiritually. You can't thrive spiritually. You can't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, you know what your life is like? It's a lot like the life of Barabbas. So you too are guilty of insubordination or insurrection. You too are a rebel, a rebel against the king of the universe. You don't love him, you don't respect him, left to yourself, that's the way it is. And not only that, but you're a murderer. The Bible says that hatred is equated with murder. It's basically murder that takes place in the heart. And is there anyone in here who would say, I've never hated anyone, or I've never been angry with anyone else? None of us would say that. So here are reminders that we need a substitute, that we are worthy of death. We are just as guilty as Barabbas in the spiritual court of God. And here's what he does. He sends his son to live the perfect life, the life that we could never live. Perfectly loving his father, perfectly loving everyone around him. And then, as we'll see in a little bit here, he'll send his son to the cross. You need a substitute. God provided a substitute for you. A lot of you in here have played sports before. You know what that's like when you're out there on the field and you're getting tired or you're you're hurt and you need a sub and you look over to the coach and you give him a signal and he sends a substitute in for you. Essentially, God has sent us the perfect substitute. He has sent us his son to do what we could never do, love him, love the people around us perfectly, and then take the death that we deserve. And that's what he did. He took our death, and so we'll just read a few verses. If you jump down to verse 33, as they were clamoring for his crucifixion, Pilate finally gave in. And it says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And then if you jump ahead to verse 46, we see where Jesus dies. It says, Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last So for starters, I want you to remember the death of Christ. Remember that he took the punishment you deserve, took it upon himself so that you could live. The innocent one died for the guilty so that you could be forgiven. So it all starts there. Let's sing some more and we'll come back in a few minutes and look at the life of of Christ, the resurrection life of Christ. There's kind of a fad right now. It's kind of popular to be gospel-centered right now, and a lot of churches are talking about gospel-centeredness and talking about God's grace and saying we need to get back to the gospel in terms of how we grow as Christians, as we, how we live the Christian life. What I'm finding, this temptation to just start focusing now on this concept of gospel-centeredness or grace and forget the blazing glory of the person of Jesus Christ who had Jeff Pierce on his mind when he came to earth over 2,000 years ago and when he lived his life in perfection and when he was falsely accused 
and tried and whipped and beaten. As he hung on the cross and looked at the people staring at him, mocking him and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. It's powerful. There's nothing in this world that can display for you that type of love or grace. There's power in the cross. And it's not just some concept. <laughs> it's reality. It's a historical event that took place that has profound implications for anyone and everyone who will embrace that message. But it didn't end with his death, did it? It didn't end with his death. Not only did he die for us, but he also rose for us. Luke 24, Luke 24, verses 1 through 9. It says, On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So these women came to the tomb expecting to find Jesus' body, And instead, they encounter two angels who tell them, he's not here. They ask a very important question. Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? Remember what he told you? Told you he would rise. He did. He's alive. Of course, they go back and report to the others, and there's great rejoicing, great celebration. And then not long after that, Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you. He stands before them, fully alive, scars in his hands, but fully alive. Reminds us that God has solved our biggest problem. You see, we, like Barabbas, guilty, deserving of punishment, deserving of condemnation, deserving of death. And that's why death is in this world, because of sin, because of that rebellion. Death is a reality. There are reminders of death all around us all the time. Most of you have been sick in one way, shape, or form in the last month, probably. There's some funky plague going around our area that you've probably had, or someone in your family has had, or maybe you still have it, in which case, please don't shake our hand. But you know what's been going around, right? Reminders, little reminders of death, and here's what God is communicating. You can't live without me. You can't live without me. Jesus came, he died in our place because we deserve to die and we needed a substitute desperately. And then God resurrected him to show that he didn't just deal with the death problem, but he gives us life itself in union with him. So we know that God validated the work of Christ by raising him from the dead. It was God's stamp of approval saying, it is finished, it is done, forgiveness has been paid for fully. The resurrection also reminds us that Jesus is living right now. We, like these women, sometimes are looking around for substitutes, counterfeits, uh, things that we feel like we want to extract life from. We want to make... Uh, things in our lives, whether it's relationships or material things or pleasurable things. You want to make them for us what only Jesus can be for us. We go looking in empty tombs and God is reminding us this morning, why do you look for the living one among the dead? Jesus is life. He is life. Your husband is not life. Your wife is not life. Your kids are not life. Your vacation is not life. Your money is not life. Your car is not life. Your latte is not life. Your MacBook, Dave, is not life. (laughs) Jesus is life. It is pretty good. I know it's better than my PC, but it's not life. Jesus is life. That's why he says all throughout the Gospel of John, lest we forget over and over and over again, 
I am the resurrection and the life. I am the living bread. I am the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life, life, life. Where is it found? Not in this world, in Jesus. In Jesus alone. So God asks us, why do you seek for the living one among the dead? Remember Jesus. Remember the one who died for you, the one who was raised for you, the one who is seated right now at my right hand, interceding for you, an advocate for you. He is your life. And one day, as David said a moment ago, we'll be with him. And we'll be singing songs like this and a whole lot better than this forever to the living king. And it's going to be amazing. In the meantime, let's pray that God helps us remember. Helps us remember Jesus, our substitute, who died for us, who was raised to declare victory over death and full pardon. Would you pray with me and then we'll sing one more song. Father, thank you for this time to reflect on the, the death and resurrection of your son. Lord, forgive us for so often forgetting what he did. We're so easily distracted. Those of us who are part of church land get easily distracted by church activities and church events and the latest book or the latest popular preacher, the latest fad. Those of us who are not living in the realm of church land are distracted by material things of all kinds and sensual pleasures of all kinds. Lord, but all of us are the same in that we are incessantly idolatrous, always looking to replace your son with lesser things. Please forgive us. Please interrupt our lives, Lord, with vivid images of your son living and dying for us. Help us to see Christ dying in nakedness and shame, the very nakedness and shame that we deserve to die in because of our rebellion against you. Help us to see him dying there for us, providing full pardon and forgiveness, and help us to rejoice that we are fully covered, not just 98% covered, but 100% covered, rescued, delivered by you. And help us to remember that he not only died that day, but three days later was raised from the dead and he is alive today and help us to remember that he is sitting at your hand, your right hand right now, interceding for us, our advocate and an ever-present help in time of trouble so that when we are living idolatrously and we are looking to replace you that we will remember that he is our life, that we will, as Paul said in Colossians, set our mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for we have died and our life is hidden with Christ. Remind us, God, we trust that you will. Thank you so much for this service. Thank you for these people. I pray that they would be encouraged as we sing this last song, that they would go away from here truly reflecting on the gracious and glorious Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.